Good afternoon, everybody. Brother Keith here, First Baptist Church in Bridge City. Hope you're all doing all right. Hope you're staying healthy. Uh, I know that we have a little wave of the COVID running through our community, and uh, certainly it's running through our church here. And so I hope that you all are uh, taking care of yourself, keeping yourself safe, keeping yourself healthy, and that you are feeling fine. If you do, if you are sick, uh, we pray that uh, uh, it's been mild and the Lord is is taking care of you. As a result of this little run, one of the things that we've done here in church is we're trying to kind of minimize our in-house gatherings together. And so Wednesday nights has um, been one of the things that we uh, have cut back on. So we're not meeting tonight, uh, but I thought I'd go ahead and share a little Bible study with you that I would have been sharing tonight uh, had we uh, been meeting and um, <clears throat> if you're not familiar with, with what I do on Wednesday nights, what I do on Wednesday nights is I take a book of the Bible each week and I just kind of give a survey of that Bible. Now, I can't go in depth. I, I don't have time to go verse by verse. Um, I really just give a real big overview. I talk a little bit more about uh, historically what's going on uh, versus not so much what it's actually saying. I do give an overview of of, of what it's saying. But anyhow, that's what... I do on Wednesday nights, and I'll be doing that tonight. We're in the prophet of Micah tonight. I started this a while back in, <clears throat> we started in Genesis. I'm working straight through, so we're in Micah. You can get your Bibles. You can open up to uh, the prophet of Micah, and we will see uh, what he has to say. Like most of the prophets, it's a hard word, and it's a difficult word, but it's for the people of God, and God wants them um, to hear it. So, Micah chapter 1, I'm going to start in verse 1. I, we get a little opportunity from verse 1 just to kind of give us an overview of what's going on. It says, The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moraseth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. A few things here. One, we see that uh, Micah is from Moraseth. Moraseth was about, Moraseth was about 20 miles south of Jerusalem, probably just a small little uh, hole in the road, really, you know, uh, which means Michael was probably just an old country boy. He was probably just an old country preacher, but then the Lord anointed him uh, to bring a message. And But his message <clears throat> was to the entire kingdom. Um, uh, it says concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. So now at this time, the kingdom is divided. There's actually two kingdoms. There is uh, the northern kingdom, Israel, and there is the southern kingdom of Judah, Samaria representing um, Israel and uh, Jerusalem in this verse one representing Judah. Uh, and a lot of guys prophesied to one kingdom or the other, but uh, uh, Micah's prophecy was to both. It was to the entire kingdom, both the north uh, and the south. It says that it was in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the king's of Judah. So that means we know that he was a contemporary of Isaiah and Hosea. Uh, he prophesied at the same time to the same people under the same conditions, uh, but his word was just a little bit different. Um, if you kind of wanted to break this down in, in, into kind of an outline, you could say the first two chapters uh, is he prophesies about the coming judgment that God is pronouncing upon them. In verses three through five, he begins to talk about the coming ruler that God is going to send. And then uh, in chapter six and seven, it is ultimately the coming kingdom uh, that this ruler that God is sending is, is going to bring, bring in with him. Oh, let me read. Um, let me read the first five, six verses. I'm going to just read a little bit and then I'll stop. Uh, this is the pronouncement of the judgment upon the, uh, Israel and Judah, Samaria and Jerusalem, uh, by God for their sins. Hear all you peoples, listen, O earth, and all that is in it. Let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. Behold, the Lord is coming out of his place. He will come down. He will tread on the high places of the earth. <clears throat> the mountains will melt under him. The valleys will split like wax before the fire, like waters poured down a steep place. All this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? 
What are the high places of Ju Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? And so you see here, he says that God's coming and he's bringing his judgment. Um, and it's going to be upon both Israel and Judah uh, there in verse 5. And it is uh, <clears throat> for their sins. And actually, he talks about the high places. And, and so here's, here's the deal. Both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom had were finding themselves at this time in a time of real idolatry where they were they were basically worshiping idols or uh, and or false gods and so the northern kingdom here's here's what happened so the kingdom was one kingdom until solomon died and upon solomon's death the kingdom is then going to be divided and jeroboam is going to rule uh in israel in the northern kingdom uh, 10 tribes there. And what happened was, and the, you can read this in 1 Kings chapter 12, and it starts in about uh, verse 25. What happened there was Jeroboam didn't want the people going to Jerusalem, which is in the southern kingdom of Judah, uh, which is where the temple was. He didn't want them going there to the temple to practice their religion because he was afraid that if they did, uh, that their hearts would begin to be turned towards Judah and their minds, and they would want to be a part of Judah. And then, so they would reject him as a king. So he didn't want them going down to Judah, to Jerusalem, to the temple to worship. So what he did is he set him up a couple of high places. He built a couple of golden calves. He set one up in a temple in Dan and one up in a temple in Bethel. And he said to the people, look, you don't have to go to Jerusalem anymore. You can just worship right here. And, uh, and that way he could keep them in country. Uh, he could keep uh, their hearts and their minds under his uh, influence, and it, they wouldn't, he wouldn't have to worry about them being led astray. Of course, we understand that is obvious idolatry. Uh, <clears throat> the southern kingdom, though, Judah, although they had the temple, uh, the place where people worship, and although they were certainly going through the motions of, of carrying out the law of God, they also had idolatry. They had basically... Um, adopted the Canaanite um, culture uh, into their own lives. And Canaan, the land of Canaan, is the promised land. It's the land that God gave them. Uh, but this Canaanite culture uh, became something that, that they became attached to. It became something that they began to incorporate into their own life. And certainly the Canaanite uh, religion they began to incorporate. Now, they still went through the motions. They still went through the sacrifices. They still went through the temple. They still did the things that they were supposed to do um, from a Hebrew standpoint. Uh, but they also were adopting a lot of these Canaanite religious practices. And so uh, God said it's, it's idolatry. He said, I'm, I'm bringing judgment upon you. You've got your own high places. There at the end of verse 5, and what are the high places of Judah? That Are they not Jerusalem? He said, you've got your own high places. You've got your own idolatry going on. And it's because of that that I am going to uh, bring destruction upon you. And that's verses 6 through 9. He says, I'm going to bring destruction, and, and, it's, and it's coming. And um, chapter 2, uh, first couple of verses says, Woe to those who devise iniquity and work out evil on their beds. At morning light they practice it because it's in the power of their hand. They covet fields and take them by violence and houses and seize them. So they oppress a man in his house, a man and his inheritance. So they really had a couple of main sins. And one of the main sins that they had was covetousness. So you can see here, verse 2, they covet fields, they take them by violence, also houses and seize them. So listen, if you've ever watched like some of the old Western movies, and I suppose I've watched them, watched them all, one of the the main themes of some of the old Westerns is that there's always this evil, you know, cattle or land baron that, that comes to town and um, he's got money and his money buys him influence and buys him power. And then he just begins to um, use his influence and his money and his power uh, to force people off their homes, out of their ranches, poorer people off their homes, out of their ranches. And he buys them up and he takes them over. And 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 that's, that's exactly what uh, Micah is describing here about coveting fields and taking them by violence and houses and seizing them. And this is what he saw happening is that people who had money and people who had influence and power 
and they were oppressing uh, the poor. And they were not only oppressing it, but they were taking what these people had because they saw it and they want them. He said that you covet this field and so you get it. You covet this uh, house and so you get it. So not long ago in Sunday school, we went over uh, the Ten Commandments and we came to the Ten Commandments and it's about covetousness. I really felt like God opened my eyes to something here. We don't talk about this commandment very much, but let me tell you, this commandment is is huge and it's at the root of our hearts look this commandment will cause you to break every other commandment it really will uh in fact in colossians chapter 3 verse 5 it says that covetousness is idolatry when you see something someone else has and you want it that's idolatry when that grabs your heart and you want what they have that is idolatry so it causes us to break the first two commandments right there it will cause us to break all the others as david of what covetousness will do. It caused him to commit adultery and murder. It'll cause you to lie. It'll cause you to steal. It'll cause you to kill. It'll cause you to not honor the Lord's day. It'll cause you to dishonor your parents. Um, covetousness is the root and it will lead us uh, to breaking all the other commandments. Listen, this this sin is alive and well in, in us in our culture, in our church, in the people of God today, right here in America. We call it materialism though, but let's just be real honest. It's covetousness. We see something, we want it, and we'll do whatever we take, whatever it takes if we're not careful uh, in order to get out there and, and get it. And it's something we better deal with. It's something we better deal with, or it's going to lead us down a path of sinfulness that's going to uh, take us far away from the heart of God. It had led God's people here down the path to the point that God was bringing judgment upon them. God was fixing to wipe them out, and and uh, he was fixing to destroy them. In fact, he's going to completely wipe out uh, the northern kingdom, uh, the northern kingdom of, of Israel, which we call the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel. He brings Assyria in. And they will be annihilated and carried off captive into uttermost, uttermost parts of the world uh, and distributed out as people. He's going to completely do away with them uh, there. So starting in verse 6, and I, I, I'm not going to read it, but, but you can read it. In fact, if you have like little headings uh, in your Bible, it might say they're lying prophets. One of the other problems that they had is that their prophets were lying to them. And not only were the prophets lying to them, but the people liked it. They they liked what the prophets were saying. They were listening uh, to the lies uh, that the that the prophets told. Here's in essence what the prophets were saying and why it was a lie. The prophets were saying, "Look, you're okay. Don't worry about it. You don't have to. You don't have to worry about all this sin. You don't have to worry about being accountable to God. You know why? You're children of Abraham. You're God's people." You are the people of God. You are the descendants of Abraham. You are of the seed of David. You don't have to worry about God bringing judgment upon you, or you don't have to worry about your sin. Just continue to go through these motions. Continue to offer your sacrifices. You are God's children. You are God's people. You're descendants of Abraham. Don't worry about it. Problem is, it was a lie. The problem is, is that they did need to worry about it and they better start worrying about it. These are typical of what people, Jesus said of the Pharisees, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. In Luke chapter three, and I think it's in, in verse five, actually it's in verse eight, in Luke chapter three, verse eight, you know, John the Baptist is preaching and calling the people to repent and they, they basically come to him and, and they're like, we're Abraham's seed. We're Abraham's children. What what do we got to repent about? And and, Ab and John the Baptist said to them, let me tell you something. God can raise up children from Abraham out of these rocks. All right? He said, it's not about who your heritage is. It's about where your heart is. And it's about where your life is. First Peter uh, chapter 4, verse 17 says that judgment is going to begin in the house of God. Look, let me tell you something. I don't care what sign, what, what name is on the sign of whatever church you go to. I don't care if you fly the flag of the name of the Lord over your own life. It's not about the words that you say. It's not about the name that's plastered on the sign of the church that you go to. It's not even about who you claim to belong to. It's about 
about what's going on in your heart and what's going on in your life. And is your heart intent upon being close to God and following the Lord? And if not, then we need to repent of the sin that is in our lives. That's what they need to do. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. Look, don't ever think that because you belong to God, God's not going to discipline you and God's not going to bring judgment upon you. Again, 1 Peter 4, 17. He said judgment's going to begin at the house of God. You know why? We're more responsible for our lives. You know why? Because we do know better. And not only because we know better, but we are a witness to the world. And therefore, the people of God had better humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. The people of God need to turn from their wicked ways. It's the people of God who need to repent. It's the people of God. Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 3. Uh, uh, the writer there says, look, if you're a child of God, you better get one thing ready. You better get one thing clear in your heart. He's going to discipline you. He's going to discipline you. He's going to bring discipline into your life. So look, let's, listen, we can never get to this place to where we think because, you know, I'm Baptist and I've been a Baptist all my life or or even just because, you know, well, I believe in the Lord. We can never come to this place that all of those things make us think that we don't have to repent of our sin, that all of those things are just means that God's just going to say, well, it's okay. Listen, it's, it's not okay. And it's especially not okay for God's people to be living in open sin and unrepentant. God's people need to be repentant more than anybody because we know better. Number one, we have the spirit of God living inside of us and we are the witness uh, to the world. Um, so he was bringing his judgment uh, upon the people uh, for that. And we uh, had better take heed and take note uh, that we don't fall into those uh, same things. Um, so in chapter three, it's really kind of a recount of, of those same things. Uh, he does talk about the sins of the prophets there starting in verse five. I like what Micah says in verse eight, though. He says, but I am full of power by the Holy Spirit of the Lord and of justice and of might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. In, in essence, he's kind of saying this. Look, I don't care what these other prophets are telling you. He's saying, I am full of the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to tell you exactly what the Lord tells me to tell you. And that means I'm going to point out your sin to you. You know, yeah, I know people don't like it when preachers point out their sin. I know that people don't like it when people uh, p point out the the deficiencies uh, that that God has. But but I got to tell you, look, as 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 prophets of God, I use that word a little bit loosely. But as people who speak for the Lord and who God puts a message in their heart, listen, they've got to they've got to give you the word of God. They've got to show you uh, exactly what it is um, that 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 God wants uh, for you to know. You know, I hate when this happens to me. There's a verse in here that uh, that I wanted to point out to you, and I have completely lost it. I've lost it in my mind. Um, oh, well, I guess I'll just have to uh, let it go as much as I, I hate to do that. Um, so in chapter 4, uh, chapter 5, he starts talking about uh, the coming Messiah. Actually, there's that verse I'm looking for. Uh in chapter 5, starting in verse 2, he says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be the ruler of Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. And so here's a prophecy about the coming Messiah. It's a prophecy about the coming Christ. Bethlehem, you're small, but you know what? You're going to give forth, you're going to give birth to a great ruler. And he's going to be from old and from everlasting. Obviously a reference uh, to Christ. Uh, verse 4, he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall abide, and now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. And this one shall be peace. The very first phrase of, of verse 5 says, and this one shall be peace. I like that. I, and, and that kind of resonates with me exactly now because of this. I preached about this uh, Sunday morning, and you can um, probably scroll down on our page here just a little bit and find Sunday morning sermon. Let me, let me tell you something that I believe and, and the thing that I said Sunday. I believe that one of the things that 2020 has done is it has revealed to me that God's people are lacking, tremendously lacking 
in one, in something. I called it a vitamin deficiency. Actually, what I called it was a fruit of the spirit deficiency. There is a deficiency of the of a particular fruit of the spirit in God's people, and that deficiency is from the fruit of peace. Fruits of the spirit are love, joy, peace, on and on, long suffering, gentleness, kindness, goodness, meekness, self control. <coughs> But peace, we lack peace. If there's one thing that 2020 has shown us, or as I believe has shown me, it is that it is revealed that God's people lack peace. They lack a foundation that is strong and sure. They are living emotionally. They are living on their emotions, and their emotions are paralyzing them, and their emotions are, are taking control of them and causing them to live in fear. Instead of that deep, abiding peace, Right here, he says that this one, this coming ruler, this one that's born in Bethlehem, this one who will come, he will be peace. Christ is our peace. We need that peace. As Paul, what's Paul call it? It's the peace that passes all understanding. Uh, we That peace is found in a person. Peace is a person. It's a, it's a fruit of the spirit. The fruit is the product of, of a person that is allowing the spirit to have control of its life. And then, then the fruits of the spirit are, are naturally produced in that way. Peace comes from Christ. Peace is from God. And we need that peace. We need a heart that, that uh, desires him and wants to be near to him and wants to be close to him. Um, I know I'm, seems like I'm backing up, but uh, you can read chapter four and it talks a little bit about, um, you know, the future kingdom that's coming, uh, that this ruler is going uh, to be uh, the ruler of. Chapter 6, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to read verses 6 through 8. I just want to look at them just for a second. Yeah, you know, look, well, let me just read 6 and 7 first of all. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before uh, the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old, um, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give the firstborn uh, for, the, uh, for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? You know, here's, here's the person. And did you, ever just, did you ever just come to a place in your life and you're just like, God, what do you want from me? Uh, what, really, God, wh what do you want from me? I mean, I, I'm here. I'm trying. I'm doing the best I can. Nothing ever works out. It never really happens. Just what exactly do you want from me? Do you want money? Do you want my firstborn? Do you want my right arm? What exactly is it, God, that you want from me? Well, here we go right here. That's that's the way he was uh, offering this right now. 10,000 rivers of oil? You want sacrifices? Do you want my firstborn? What do you want? And then he said, well, he has shown you, oh, man, what is good. First of all, to do justly. You know what? Do the right thing. He wants you to do the right thing. He just got through talking about, you know, them that covetousness and how it was leading them to oppress people and, and uh, to use their money and their influence and their power to, to get things. He said, first of all, do the right thing. Treat people in the right way. Do the right thing. And then to love mercy. Now, to love mercy is not just to love receiving mercy because everybody wants to get some mercy, right? He said, but look, how about giving some mercy? How about being merciful to others? You realize mercy is when you is when someone deserves punishment, but you choose not to give it to them. That's mercy. How about how about you find someone that deserves you to be mad at them, that deserves you to want revenge upon them, and how about you just say, you know what? I'm going to give you forgiveness instead. I'm going to give you mercy. It's yeah, we all want mercy when we need it. But how about giving mercy? He wants you to do the right thing. He wants you to love mercy by being merciful. And then he wants you to walk humbly with your God. You know what God wants from you more than anything else? He wants you. That's what he wants. What God wants from you more than anything else is you. He wants you more than he wants your money. He wants you more than he wants this, more than he wants that. He wants you. He wants you to walk with him. He wants you uh, to to desire to be close to him. He wants you to live with your heart close to his heart. He just wants you to walk with him daily, uh, every day through uh, the things of life. He's told you, oh man, what is good, to do justice, uh, to love mercy, and to walk humbly uh, with your God. So just uh, final 
Um, he talks about this final kingdom. He talks about how God is going to ultimately forgive Israel. Uh, verse 18 of chapter 7. He says, Who is God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? heritage excuse me. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. Uh, he pardons sin. He forgives sin. He doesn't hold on to his anger forever because he delights in mercy. You see, God delights in being merciful. Um, so I, I want to close with this one little story from 2 Samuel chapter 24. And 2 Samuel chapter 24 is at the end of David's life. And David has taken a census, but he's taken this census out of his own pride. He wanted to see how big his army was, how many fighting men he had, and all this kind of stuff. And he realized um, in verse 10 of 2 Samuel 24 that his heart condemned him uh, after he had numbered the people, after he had taken them this census. And he knew he had sinned. And, and uh, God sends the prophet Gad uh, to go to David. And in verse 12, he says, You go and you tell David this, thus says the Lord. I offer you th three things, and you choose one of them. Um, so Gad went, and, and he told David. He came to David, and he told him. And he said, here's your choices. Your pun these, are, these are his punishment choices. Uh, seven years of famine. Uh, you're going to have to run from your enemies for three months. Or I'm going to give three days of a huge plague upon your land. And uh, in verse 14, David just said, you know what, Gad? He said, um, I'm in, I'm in great distress. He, he didn't know what to choose. Uh, he said, I'm in great distress. He said, this is all I know. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord because his mercies are great. He said, you know what? I can't choose. I can't choose my punishment. But whatever my punishment is, just let me fall into God's hand because I know that God is merciful. And so I've been talking a lot about, about judgment, and it'll begin about the house of God, and we are, need to stop kidding ourselves and thinking that we won't receive God's judgment. We will, but look, we also receive his mercy. We also receive his compassion because we are his children. And so, look, let's repent. Let's turn from our sins. Let's restore our relationship with God so that we can be the people that he wants us to be. But when we have fallen astray and that time for judgment comes and it begins to come, take comfort in knowing that you belong to God. All right, so again, that's Micah. That's a quick overview that we did in about 27 minutes here. Look, I want to invite you uh, to come and join us Sunday mornings at 1030. We are not shut down. We are not online only, okay? We are still gathering uh, as the people of God for the worship of God on Sunday mornings at 1030. I invite you to come. I encourage you to come. I want you to come. Look, if you've been sick within the last 10 days, please don't come. Um, if you come, we're asking you to wear a mask for a little while. Uh, we're asking you to social distance and, and to be aware of those two things. But mostly what I'm asking you to do is come with a heart that wants to worship God. Come with a heart that wants to, that wants to find God and find Jesus. But we want you to come and we want you, uh, to be a part. And so I invite you to do that. Of course, I understand you're all adults. I understand you've all got different things going on in your lives. And you need to make the best decision that's right for you. I always have and always will respect that. But look, if you can and are willing and are able, we need to gather together as the people of God here in this community for the worship of our God. Hey, love you guys. Um, take care of yourselves. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. We got to get back to doing that uh, and just kind of get through this little wave here. And we're going to get through it. We are going to get through it. And everything is going to be all right. Love you. See you Sunday. Take care. God bless. Bye-bye.